my firstborn son, Joshua Bell, um, he, at the age of 23, was in a car accident. And um, he was prescribed opioids. And actually, his first drug dealers wore white coats. Um, they did four years of undergrad. They did another three years of medical school. They did another two years of residency. And um, they provided him with eight years of opioids. Hi, I'm Delegate John Bell. Nice to meet you. Virginia Delegate John Bell works hard for the people in his district on issues like women's rights and affordable health care. But his focus lately has been the opioid addiction crisis, ever since he discovered that his own son, Josh, had become an addict. He was in a car accident seven years ago, and in the car accident, he injured his neck. They never took an x-ray, nothing. The doctor looked at my neck for a second and then he gave me some Vicodin. And when he came out of the emergency room, he came out with an opioid prescription for 90 days with five refills. I remember when I got home that night and I took it, it's like the first time experiencing love. Then they noticed that he was having a problem and they just suddenly cut him off. Um, they didn't talk about rehab, they didn't talk about tapering off, they just said, okay, we're done. Josh's opioid addiction quickly turned from pills to heroin. The high was so powerful, I felt like what I felt like early in my addiction, it just got terrible from there. With his addiction out of control, Josh sought help at pain management clinics, but it didn't help. The doctors spent very little time with us as patients. We never talked about recovery, we never talked about therapy. It was, here's the medication we're gonna give you. There was no warnings. They never, they never told me that this was gonna be leading to um, something greater than this or that I'm gonna keep wanting more. There was nothing wrong with him. Yet he had Vicodin, Gabapentin, um, Oxycontin. Josh has been sober for nine months and is eager to use his experience to help others. All we want to do is once we find recovery is help someone else find recovery because we know how dark it was and how good it feels not to live a lie anymore. I was at work and I got a, a call from a detective and um, he just told me straight out, your, son's, your son has passed away. Um, he didn't ask, where are you? Which I think that's one thing you should ask. He didn't, I could have been driving. Um, but I was at work in a pretty open cube of 150 people. Um, I wish I was in more of a private place. Um, and then that was it. They, Closed the case, there was no follow-up. I never thought my brother would die from an overdose, no matter how far he was into his addiction. I thought he'd end up on the street before he'd end up dead. We also weren't aware of fentanyl at that time. In his talk screen, he had um, fentanyl and other drugs. So the fentanyl was mixed, mixed in with Xanax. He just Xanax was like his Achilles heel. It's just, and I would tell him, why, why can't you get off the Xanax? And he just, he said, I don't know, Mom. I don't know. Um, and it's not like he would take it and he was nice and relaxed. He was like a maniac. It was, I didn't, I couldn't even comprehend why anyone would want to feel that. I would think if you want to get high, you'd want to feel good. But I guess not necessarily. It wasn't always chaotic, but when he was active recovery, I remember many nights I would just stay up. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, just check my phone to make sure he was alive, make sure he's posting posts, make sure he's still there, make sure he's still alive. I, like, especially when I knew he was going on his binges and he was posting on Snapchat all the time. I was very surprised of the amount of opioids he was doing. Um, I knew he was on painkillers because he was given to them, you know, a doctor gave them to him. 
I couldn't understand why the array of drugs for somebody who was physically okay. Um, so my trust in the medical community has obviously weaned, you know, on the downward spiral on that. Um, I do believe you have to be your own best advocate when it comes to anything medical. Um, and the heartache of losing my first unconditional love. We fought, we argued, um, but he was my biggest supporter. He was um, always there for you. He was an all or nothing kind of guy. You knew if he liked you, you knew if he didn't. And he was a very, he's very sensitive, extremely bright, funny. He's never met a stranger. Um, and we clicked. Like, I have four children, yet this guy can call me up and say like, hey, beautiful. And I'm like, oh, baby, what do you want? And like the other three, I'm like, why hadn't they learned that? But you know, so like, follow what your brother's doing and get whatever you want from your mom. After all this, I have learned that sibling loss is the least talked about loss. And probably, I'm not gonna say it's even where close to a child, a mother, a parent losing a child, but I have to watch my mom, my parents go through the worst pain in the whole entire world. He died in January 17, 2019. And um, <clears throat> from then we've been trying to advocate um, anything that I can get my hands on to bring awareness um, of the dangers of fentanyl, of the dangers of drugs in general, and um, I wrote a little children's book. Um, it's called Josh and Zizi, um, because there was nothing out there for children. The people that are dying all have young kids. So I did that. Um, we're trying to get into the schools to try and get awareness of just even to get the word out just the word fentanyl out, so these kids, because I think right now we would have to target the very young to, to overcome the addiction problems that we have today. I really feel like it's the younger we go, the better, because it's so deadly. I've learned compassion. I've learned that I'm never gonna understand why an addict does and at what they do. And for a lot of times I tried to like understand and I've wasted a lot of time trying to understand instead of the time I could have given with just compassion.